Status quo. On the bulletin cover, what does it say? Don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. The name of the game is keeping the status quo. Don't rock the boat. This idiom is used not to upset the status quo. And as I'm reading that, you can turn to uh, 1 Chronicles chapter 4. 1 Chronicles chapter 4. Keep everything like it is. Don't change anything. Don't mess up the situation. Don't do anything drastic. Keep things as they are. Stay normal and stay calm. And don't make anyone upset. I'm already out of that category, so I make everybody upset. The normal Christian life. That's what we look at, the normal Christian life. I sit in my seat, and that's my seat, unless you came and put a, a name on the bottom of it, but then we have a problem because when Awana is inside, we stack up all the chairs, and then we move them back, and we don't know what chair is what. Amazing, huh? So status quo. You come into the church, you know where your seat is, you sit down, and you know what you have to do, and then the service is ended, then you go out, and you say about the same thing, you see about the same people that you know, and keep the status quo. That's what we do. Go to Sunday school, accept Jesus Christ as Savior, grow up in a church, become faithful, and then we are a pew sitter until death do us part. We have become, don't rock the boat. And that is a Christian life. Well, Hopefully that will change today. So number one, a realization that we are in the status quo. We have to realize that we keep doing the same thing. And my dear wife doesn't like the status quo. I just go with the flow at home. So anyway, Michael, yesterday on his... Facebook or on someone's Facebook was it his or yours Jane or whatever and said wow they have this person has five chickens for sale and they're they're a year old they already are laying eggs as soon as you say that my wife goes really we have to go and get it and it says first come first serve and so they got in the truck I was keeping the house warm, the status quo, but Shane and Michael and, Sh and, and, and uh, Charlene, they get into the truck and they go over to a place in Galt and, and, uh, and love the name of the road, Waldo, Waldo Road. Is that great? Where's Waldo? Anyway, how many did you get? I mean, six of them. Okay, six, six chickens, you know, and then I'm saying, you know, there's something called a pecking order with chickens. You know that, right? And, and we have only three of our chickens left from 19. They just happened like that. And, and so we put them all in the, the, the coop last night and everything. But see, in my life, in my family, every day is exciting. Nothing is the status quo. I just go with it. And then I come home, and then Michael and Shana's little dog, St. Bernard, Dino, is there, and she has a new kitten, and... I don't even like animals, and here this is what happens. Okay, but I just go with it. They rock my world all the time, and I just go with it. Whew. But anyway, here is a magnificent verse. A book was out years ago called The Prayer of Jabez, okay? And this is a verse in verse 9, and then we will be looking at verse 10 a little bit later, but let's do verse 9 first. Now, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore you in pain. Can you imagine every day they would call him Jabez? In other words, you're a painful kid. That's his name. But the Bible says he was more honorable than his brothers and his sisters. Wow. So that's verse nine, 9. Status quo. We don't want to rock the boat at all. That's what happens. 
Here Jabez was already an honorable man. Matter of fact, more honorable than the rest of his family. As I mentioned, his name means born in pain. Obviously, his mother was going through a difficult time when he was born. But his birth became her joy later in life because of his honorable character. What a blessing. Jabez decided to rock the boat and step out of his comfort zone. This is our problem. We get so comfortable in our situation. We never want to stretch ourselves. We need to do that as Christians. So let's look at verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. This is the only verse in the Bible, verses in the Bible concerning Jabez. You know that? But oh, what a character this guy was. And I'll tell you what, I will take a Jabez anytime. This guy is not interested in the status quo. He doesn't care about what seat he sits in. He cares about what ministry he's going to be involved in. Amazing individual. So let's look at these four things that he did. First of all, Jabez called on the Lord. When you have a situation in your life, I hope you call on the Lord. Matter of fact, before you have your situation, call on the Lord. And I would submit to you that I think Jabez already had a great fellowship with the Lord because he wanted the Lord to do more. He wanted to get out of his comfort zone. Amazing. That's what he wanted. To stretch himself. He realized that he wasn't satisfied with his life. The way that it was needed and uh, the way that it was and it is needed to get out of the status quo and rock the boat. He prayed that you may bless me. That's very difficult because this is what happens. We get so comfortable in our situation and we don't want anything upset about it. And we want to stay right there in the status quo because we are comfortable. Well, Jabez did not want this. This is a heart that comes in full assurance to the Lord, wanting to step out and asking God for the courage to do so. Number two, enlarge my territory. Enlarge my territory. Increase my ministry. Increase my ministry. This is an open-ended request. More time, more talents, more money, more dedication, more souls for the Lord, more influences on others. That's open-ended. But Lord, I do this, I do that. What do you think Jabez did? He wanted to get out of the rut of status quo. And he was probably very active serving the Lord. That was not the question. What he wanted was to enlarge his borders. Do you have the courage to pray that way? Can you put your actions to your prayers? Can you make yourself more available for the ministry? Can you do that? Well, Lord, I'm kind of getting up in age now and I'm old and I let some of the younger people do it. Oh, boy. I think you don't read your Bible. If you're still kicking... There's things you can do for God. So a friend of mine, years ago, Ed Micah, very successful businessman, very successful. He retires at, I don't know what he retired at. I mean, I'm younger at the time, so I'm not thinking about age. I guess he was about 70-ish when he retires. And so what does that do? He calls up a mission board. The Evangelical Baptist Mission Board, I think it was. And he says, who can I talk to? I want to work with the mission board. And he says, I've just retired from business. 
I've been a long time uh, elder in the church. I want to serve the Lord. Can you help me? And they said, come on down. So he goes down. And he became one of their directors because he wanted to increase himself. And he told me, he said, God, just start my life again. This is great. Most people kind of wind it down at 70. But he wanted to start up again. And he was in that capacity for at least 15 years that I know of. At least. Because he asked God to increase his territory, enlarge my territory. Do you have the courage to pray that way? Do you? Number three, that your hand will guide my life. And as soon as I started writing this message, I wrote these words down that the hymn writer penned many years ago. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Well, verse 2 says, take my hands. Verse 3 says, take my voice. And then verse 4 says, take my silver and my gold. And my gold. Then it says, take my love. And probably the biggest part to take that Jabez had to deal with was his heart. And here it is. This is what it says. Take my will and make it thine. It shall be no longer mine. Take my heart. It is thine own. It shall be thy royal throne. It shall be thy royal throne. So the question, are you afraid that he may call you somewhere else? Are you afraid that it's going to be too much work that he's going to give you? Why are we that way? And then number four, keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. Well, that's a good prayer. That's a good prayer. Jabez wanted to be a blessing. So hence we sang the song, Make Me a Blessing. Also, I I planned during this message that I was going to have the PowerPoint on uh, faith promise as well. Because it's how God can make us a blessing. Why don't we step out of our box for a little bit? Why don't we step on the line? Why don't we start serving instead of being a big, giant sponge and soaking it all up? Why don't we start giving it out? Keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. Jabez wanted to be a blessing. Jabez needed to get closer to the Lord and so that the Lord would continue to use him. Wow. Okay, let's go to the second point here. Second major point. Get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. Matthew. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 28 and 29. Now, I'm not much for boats. I don't get seasick that I know of. I've been on boats before and it doesn't bother me. But I don't know. There's something about the ground that I like. And I like to eat fish, but I don't like to fish for fish. So that's just not my thing. I'd rather chase a little white ball around the golf course. As few shots as possible. And I keep failing at it. Okay. I just like to play golf again if my shoulder will, will let me one of these days. But anyway, get out of the boat. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28 and 29. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. What? Wow. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water To go see Jesus. Wow. End of story. We're not going to go through the rest of the story. No, we will. But why is it every time we hear this message, it's about the lack of faith on Peter and so forth and so on. Okay. What a crazy idea. Walking on water like Jesus Christ. Do you know we criticize Peter for many things, but not this step of faith. The question I would like to give to you is this. Why didn't John the Beloved jump out of the boat 
And what about his brother James? Why didn't they go out of the boat? Huh. Those two together, John and James wanted to sit on the right end of, the, of Christ, but jump out of the boat? What are we, crazy? Whew. What about Thomas? What about Bartholomew? What about all the others? You know, before Thomas got his moniker of the doubter, do you know that Thomas was the, probably the, one of the most dedicated disciples who had probably a lot more faith than the others did? But you know why he doubted? He wasn't present. You know why you lose a blessing sometime not coming to church? Because you weren't there. Okay? That's another message another time. Okay. But what about these people? We always want to stay in our safety net and never want to step out and take a chance. I will tell you that day. And the waves are going up and down like this. And Peter says, Lord... Go ahead, I'm going to walk to you, Lord. He jumps out of the boat, and he's a walking on the water. That's pretty cool. I'll tell you why. I've tried to walk on water before, but I can only do it at 32 degrees. That's it. Called ice for you Californians that never ice skated before. Okay? <laughs> and you can try not to sink, and you're going to sink, sink, sink. So Paul, Peter jumps out of the boat. He probably was surprised himself. I'm walking on water. We want to stay in the safety zone. We get rid of the status quo by jumping out of our boats. And that's what happens there. Verse 29, he, sa he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water to go to Jesus. Peter is the only other man in the history of the world that walked on water that wasn't frozen. Period. How far did he walk? I think he walked quite a distance. And now how do I know that? He couldn't make out if it was the Lord or not. See? He's looking. Lord, is that you? Is that you coming, Lord? Is that you? Is that you? And so what happens is, he looks and he said, Lord, if it's you, let me come. Let me jump out of the boat. Let me walk on water. And Peter jumps out of the boat. And he starts walking. Now, this is pretty cool because I'll tell you what, I don't think he took three steps and fell. I don't think that was the problem. I think he took about 20, 30, 40, 50 60 steps, and Christ is coming to him, and Peter's walking on the water, but he's doing great. Better than John and James. They were in the boat, see? Wow. So he couldn't make out the Lord, so he called to him and asked if, if, if it was him. He jumps out of the boat, a rough sea, verse 30. All right, here's some of the problems that we talk about in Matthew 14, 30. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, but well, we don't use that word much today, boisterous. Say, I'll say that in my history class, boisterous, and I'll go, Pastor Mohan, what does that mean? <laughs> you know. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And so John and James and the other disciples in the boat went, see, I told you he couldn't do it. <laughs> now the Bible doesn't say he said that. They said that. But you know what? I know human nature, don't you? Phew. Okay. He begins to sink. Now, this is another amazing part of the verse. He begins to sink. If I step out on a boat, I'm sinking. It's like he starts to go down like a little escalator. He's he's beginning to sink. And what does the Lord do? He reaches out His hand. It says in verse 31, And immediately Jesus stretched out His hand and caught Him and said to Him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? The Lord knows when you doubt and when you start to sink and when you don't. Isn't that the case? He knows that. It's amazing right here. He begins to sink and then Peter moves closer to the Christ 
and, they st- and he, st- and he st- saves them from, from sinking. I don't know how long he was walking on that water for, but I don't think it was about 10 seconds. I think it was probably a few minutes. And by the time Jesus comes to Peter and Peter starts to look around him at the wind and the sea and the waves and everything, all of a sudden, Jesus is right there and he grabs him. Look at the results of Peter walking on the water with Christ. Verse 32. And when they got into the boat, what happened? The wind died. It ceased. Okay? Fantastic. See, if you look at this, number one, they realized that Christ was truly the Son of God. No one else has power over the weather. Especially not a weatherman. <laughs> don't, 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 wouldn't you love that at your job, that you can be mistaken so many times and still get raises, and people still tune in and, and to watch you? I would love a weatherman one time to say this. I was wrong yesterday with the forecast. I'm not going to blame the, the uh, radars and everything else. We had a wrong model, but I'm going to take uh, you know, that upon myself. I was wrong. That will never happen. Okay. Number two, they worshipped him and moved closer to him all because of the step of faith that Peter took. Isn't that amazing? Verse 33, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God? All because Peter jumped out of the boat. Number three, but he sunk. No, he walked on water. I'm not looking at it as a negative. I'm looking at it as a positive. Peter would not have sunk if he kept his eyes on the Lord. That was the problem. And that's another great lesson. Keeping your eyes on the Lord. And then number four, why are you so worried about failure in your Christian life or in your ministry? Isn't it God's ministry? Can we be honest here? I was taught this as a pastor. If I have a church of a thousand or if I have a church of 20, I need to prepare the message the same way because that's my responsibility. Well, my Sunday school class only has three people in it, you know, So I'm not going to have to study that much. What? Maybe we didn't have the same teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ. Whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do it hardly, do it with all your might. Period. Period. Okay, so go ahead and rock the boat and be used for Him. Galatians chapter 1, verses 13 to 17. I love this, Galatians chapter 1. There's so many great verses in the Bible here. And, and, and why don't you be used for a change? Instead of making excuses why God can't use me. He can use you, but it's your heart He needs to get a hold of. And that's the truth. Your heart. So Galatians chapter 1 and verses uh, 13 to 17. So it says, For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. That was Paul. We read these verses part of my message today in Sunday school. So, repetition is the best teacher, sorry. Okay. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of my father. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace and to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach Him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were the apostles before me, like Peter, like John. But I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Paul just didn't rock the boat, man. He capsized it. You understand that? I will submit to you, the reason why we're saved today is because of Paul. If you got saved by the Romans road, it's Paul. If you got saved by, for, for grace are you saved through faith, in Ephesians 2, 8, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it's because of Paul. How about this? But as many as received him, that was John's verse. In John 1, but most of the other verses about salvation, friends, they are found in 
Paul's epistles. He capsized the boat. Paul was a zealous, pharisaical Jew in verse 14. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the tradition of my father. Listen, Paul was the Donald Trump of his time in Judaism. Okay? Oh, yeah. I wish he wouldn't toot his horn so much. But anyway, Paul was tooting his horn here. Look, the oral teachings about the Old Testament, that's what it says about the traditions. Okay. It was commonly known as a halakha. The halakha. This collection of interpretations of the law eventually carried the same authority as or even greater than the law of the Torah itself. And this is the problem. The Jews took the halakha above the word of God. But Paul said, I knew the halakha, the traditions. I knew the, the Old Testament. I was more zealous than everybody. Its regulations were so hopelessly complex and burdensome that even the most astute rabbinical scholar could not master it by either interpretation or conduct. But Paul was one of the few that knew it. That was Paul. And what does he do? He jumps out of the boat. He turns it upside down. This Jew among Jews. And he, forget the status quo, he made everything different. And in verses 15 to 17, as we read before, here Paul, knowing the truth, rocked the boat and got out of the most prestigious position in Israel, that of a Pharisee. Paul was all in on the faith of Jesus Christ for three years. He had a passion to learn by the Lord in the desert and immediately had an impact on the fledgling churches and even rose above the prominent leaders of the church, Peter, John, and also the half-brother of Jesus, James. Remember, John's brother James is already dead at this time. So number four, what will it take for you to start rocking the boat? Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. What's it going to take? Maybe I should have a crowbar this morning to try to pry some of you out of your seats. <clears throat> I give up. Got a jackhammer? <laughs> Romans chapter 12 and verse 11. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. There you go. 12.11. Not lagging in diligent, what, diligence. Whatever is worth doing in the Christian life is valuable enough to be done with enthusiasm and care. If God has called you to minister with Awana, do it with great, here's a great word, Elon. You don't know what Elon means? Flare. If God has called you to teach the children at Children's Church, do it with great gusto. Youth group, do it 100%. You know, one thing when I teach 7th and 8th graders, and history is a challenging subject, because history can be very boring unless you tell them all the stories and get them interested in and so forth. Tell you the truth, some days I go to school and I don't want to be there. <laughs> it's like, can I stay home? <laughs> Because I have all these kids that need to learn, but yet you have to entertain them so they can learn. It is amazing. Instead of just going through the road and doing the lesson, you know what I can do? I can put up a PowerPoint for them and say, okay, PowerPoint one, write down the notes. PowerPoint, second slide, write down the notes. Third slide, write down the notes. But it's amazing. I have kids that write me letters when they finish and, you know, and they're in 8th grade or ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, and 12th grade. And they said, Mr. Mahood, I love your stories. Can you tell me another story? Because that's what they do. They, they love because they know that I cared for them. And when you teach a Sunday school class, when you do a WANA, when you do any other ministry or youth group, you make sure the kids know that they, that, that they are loved by you.
Hebrews chapter 6 and verses 11 and 12. Man, I'm looking at this time here, and I, I will get it done. I don't know what time, but I'll get it done. Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 11 and 12. Notice what it says, And we desire that each one of you, each one of you, show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Until you die. Until Christ comes back, be just as diligent. For you do not become sluggish. But imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Diligence unto the end. Don't stop your ministry. Breathe new life into it. Don't become sluggish or simply filling a seat. Imitate those faithful ones that came before us as well. Fervent in spirit, it says. To boil in spirit. Going back to the other verses, we're not going to turn back to Romans 12, 11. It says, fervent in spirit, to boil in spirit, to have a productive energy in serving the Lord. Do we sing? Do we read our Bible? Do we do it zealously for the Lord? Serving the Lord. This is the primary duty of every believer, but some sit around, some let others do the work, some are apathetic, some refuse, and some make excuse after excuse. Here is the all-time best excuse for a Christian when asked to do a ministry. Let me pray about it. Because they don't really mean I'm going to pray about it. It means if I say let me pray about it, then you won't ask me again because I'm praying about it. And I'll let you know. Never, never, ever. But I'm praying about it. So what will it take? Hebrews 10.24 Great verse here again. Too many great verses this morning. 10.24 And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Whoa. Stir up. I want to stir you up this morning, stimulating or inciting someone to do something. And this is what I want you to do. Serve, serve, and serve. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Boy, I'm going the wrong way in my Bible. See, I'm getting too excited here. Well, if I only had my phone to look through, it would be so much easier. Oh, I preached about that the other week. That's right. Okay, First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. And then it says, forbidding to marry. And I don't want that verse. I want the one where it says, convince and rebuke. Am I in? What, what's going on here? I can't even blame it on Tammy. She's sick. Okay. Anyway, the verse that I want, maybe a Second Timothy. I'm going to look at Second Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Ah, that is it. Second Timothy. Don't you hate that? First Timothy, Second Timothy. I gotta change that right now. Okay. There we go. Second Timothy four two. It says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Look what it has here. Number one, convince. 